Turning Point UK, you've sent me some questions indeed. Tom Hanstock from Nottingham, studying mathematics, says to me, Nigel, how do you feel we can persuade an increasingly left-wing socialist 18 to 30 age group that conservatism and capitalism is the best way forward for this country? I fear for my future at the moment. Tom, you've got a very fair point. The, I do think that a lot of the influences on 18 to 30s um, have pushed them into thinking towards a left-wing view of the world, a, a view that the state should effectively run everything. Um, I don't think there are necessarily short-term fixes to this, other than to say that I do think throughout the education system in this country and indeed throughout much of the West, uh, we're going to have to have stronger governments that start to say that people need to be taught critical thinking. People need to be taught these are different points of view. You work out for yourself which of these you agree with, rather than being told this solution is virtuous and this solution is evil. Um, and, and, and I also think uh, that if Boris Johnson can make a success of Brexit um, and to start moving us away from global political corporatism towards capitalism, where small men and women can get on and do their own thing, <coughs> then we could have a boom like the 1980s. And when we had that boom, socialism in this country virtually disappeared. Anthony from Teesside, studying psychology at university, says, Nigel, my question is, when are we going to be calling you Sir Nigel Farage, thanks to your hard work and efforts in Brussels? Oh, look, I think generally uh, peerages and knighthoods go to people who failed dramatically. Um, I, I, and you, you have to do really badly, make an absolute balls of it, and then you're off to the House of Lords or, in the old days, the European Commission, but of course no longer. Look, I, I will say this to you, Anthony, there are two types of people in politics. There are those who want to be something and those who want to do something. And those who want to be something are in it for rank, position, title. Those who want to do something actually want to try and change the world. And I've always been one of the latter, so I'm not really terribly bothered about ranks or titles. Ollie Hallmark, who is studying at Kingston College, says, Nigel, did you ever see Brexit being this long of a process? <laughs> and, uh, well, uh, and how did I feel about, and, and how uh, could you have changed the PM's deal? Look, I, 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 you know, if you'd said to me when I first uh, got involved on the, on the founding day of UKIP as a political party, that's 27 years ago, would it take this long? Um, I'd have said, I certainly, I certainly hope not. And I wonder if I'd known it was that long, whether I could have stayed the journey, because it's been the best part of my adult life. But hey, you know what? We got there in the end. As for Boris's deal, the deal itself is appalling. I mean, it's not much different to Mrs May's deal, really. But the difference is, he made a promise during that election campaign that we would sort this out in 2020 and we would not have regulatory alignment. And whilst in some ways that contradicts what he sounded in Brussels. He then put it in the election manifesto. It's been repeated over the course of the last week by the Chancellor, Sajid Javid. And if he doesn't keep to those promises, a lot of people in Britain will be very, very angry with him. So look, nothing in life's ever perfect, but we're in a much better place than we were the day Boris came back from, from Brussels in October, and a thousand percent better place than we were this time last year when Brexit looked lost and a second referendum looked pretty inevitable. So look, I think overall, be happy with where we are now. It's about as good in practical terms as it possibly could be. Harrison Carter is 14 and is in year 10 at secondary school, says, Nigel, my question is, what should the government do with the armed forces, especially given the current political climate? Uh, well, uh, Harrison, I think it's very interesting that in the last 20 years we've demanded more and more of our armed forces. Indeed, we've turned a territorial army into a reserve army, uh, you know, and they now get called up all the time uh, when we're involved in active missions. Uh, recruitment uh, to the army, uh, uh, Air Force and Navy, is now running uh, at really perilously low levels. Uh, so we've kind of burdened the forces, but not perhaps looked after them properly when they've returned. I do think it's one of those issues that Boris is conscious of because so many people have screamed about it. There is a little bit of good news coming in November this year when you know, people who've formerly been in the forces are going to get reductions on, 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 on rail fares and things like that. Uh, so I think, I think the environment 
is getting better, but I do want the culture of recruitment to change. So the army used to recruit with a slogan, be the best, boom, which says we are elite, we are good, we know what we're doing, we're proud of who we are. Oh, they've changed all that. Oh, yes. Oh, now, you know, the army's open for people. We're, we're, we're so diverse in the army. It's all so wonderful. You can have a lovely time, and if you don't really want to, well, perhaps you haven't got to kill anybody. I mean, let's just stop all this PC rubbish. Let's just get back to be the best. Let's treat our armed forces as elite. What is wrong with elite? What is wrong with saying to people, you can be really good at this, you can really succeed at this, and it's something you can be proud of, and we can be proud of. And I'm going to take one more. I mean, there are hundreds, but I'm going to take one more in this batch. But I promise I'll come back to you at TPUK before too long. Jake from Blackpool, studying at college, says, I have been an ardent Brexit supporter since the referendum. My question for you is, which EU country would you most like to see joining us become an independent nation again? Jake, I was in Strasbourg a few days ago. My last Strasbourg. Gosh, I spent four years of my life there. Um, my 242nd visit to Strasbourg since I became an MEP. A lot of people in the coffee room said, look, Nigel, if you make a success of this, we're going to be there after you. Now, whether it's Denmark, uh, whether it's Italy, uh, I don't know. It could be Poland. So there are two big splits in Europe. Think about this. The north and south of Europe are split by the Euro, which has worked well for Germany, been a catastrophe for the Mediterranean. Now there is a cultural split between the west and the east and central parts of Europe. They are devoutly Roman Catholic, proud of their identities, do not want mass immigration into their countries, uh, have a much less tolerant view of gay marriage and many other things than we would have living in the UK. But hey, isn't that their right? Aren't people allowed, culturally, to make their own decisions? And you've got a, you, you've got a, um, a Brussels administration trying to force social change on those countries. And I think that's another huge tension. So whether the breaks come because of the currency, whether they come because of cultural differences, I do think Brexit is the beginning of the end. And I'll leave you all with this thought. The UK leaving the European Union is the equivalent for the European single market. Our economy leaving is the same size as the 19 smallest countries in the EU leaving. This is a bit of a death blow for the European projects. And I very much hope we return to a Europe where we can trade together, cooperate together, be good neighbours with each other, but not be run by people like Mr Juncker.